so we're going to have to wait for the next year to issue the OFFC, and then maybe I'll We'll get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, good afternoon to everyone here in the room. Good morning, evening for anyone joining us online. Um, I have the pleasure of inviting you and welcoming you to the session on maximizing the value of health data while protecting individual rights, which is co-hosted by Transform Health together with Farm Access, Baobab Institute, Rakhinesa, the Asia eHealth Information Network, AHIN, and JSI. Uh, my name is Kirsten Matheson, and I'm the policy lead at Transform Health. We are a coalition of more than 100 organizations committed to harnessing the potential of digital health and data to achieve UHC by 2030. Transform Health, we, re we recognize the critical importance of data to strengthen health systems, to respond to health emergencies, to improve patient management, further research and innovation, and to advance universal health coverage and SDG goals. This has been further highlighted as many of us we can all recognize by the COVID-19 pandemic. The digitalization of health systems has further increased the amount of health data and health-related data that gets collected and used every day. And that offers a really huge opportunity to improve health and well-being. However, it also raises a lot of important issues around data privacy, ownership, sharing and access, and raises some important questions about who governs data and how. And also we've recognized that many of the rules to govern the collection and use of health data haven't really kept pace with the innovation through the digital transformation of health systems, nor with the potential to really maximize public value and health outcomes nor has it really kept pace with the potential risks arising from data misuse. And this is why as a coalition and with a number of our coalition partners, we're calling for, more, for stronger and more equitable governance of health data and for a global health data governance framework to be developed, adopted and domesticated by governments. We feel that a global framework could really help align governments around a common set of regulatory standards to, which would help inform national legislation and help govern the sharing of data across borders. Last year, together with coalition partners, we launched a set of health data governance principles, which are based on equity and rights. And they've been, currently been endorsed by over 140 organizations and governments. And we really see this as being a key step towards the development of a global health data governance framework. So as we start the session, um, we'd like to play a short video which just outlines some of these key issues as well as proposed action to make sure we're driving progress to st towards stronger, more equitable governance of health data and a global health data governance framework. So if we can play the video. Health systems around the world are becoming increasingly digitalized. Imagine a future where this young mother-to-be receives trusted health and nutrition information through an app that tracks all of her pregnancy milestones. The local clinic logs her vitals digitally so she doesn't need to carry her previous medical records around. This allows health workers who may not even be in the same location to track her pregnancy, diagnose any issues and prescribe supplements or medication. Her data is also anonymized and collected by district, state and national health systems. This feeds into provincial and national health planning and helps make better decisions about communities' health needs. Using real-time health data can lead to quicker response times from doctors, more accurate diagnoses, better targeted distribution of medicine and equipment, and more efficient and resilient health systems overall. It also allows researchers access to more and better information to develop new medicines and equipment. What's more, more than half the world now uses the internet. This allows health planners to reach nearly 5 billion people with better public health strategies using digital tools. 
Improving digital connectivity must remain a priority to ensure that these benefits apply to everyone and no one is left behind. While digital health and data offer huge opportunities, people are often not aware of who has access to their health data and how it's being used. Unless the collection and use of health data is regulated, there are risks that data could be used ineffectively or unethically rather than to improve health outcomes for the public. Data misuse has the potential to harm people and minimize health benefits for the population, especially for marginalized communities. So we need a system in place to protect us and ensure that our data is used for everyone's benefit. Better health data governance can protect us as individuals and protect us as a population. Health data governance is a set of rules that governments and other bodies must abide by in the collection, use and disposal of health data. Unfortunately, at the moment, there is no globally agreed set of norms and standards that guide countries, technology companies and other stakeholders on the use of our health data. Transform Health is calling for a global health data governance framework to maximize the public value of health data while protecting individual rights. A global framework would establish an agreement between nations around a set of common standards for the governance of health data. A global framework must be developed through a fully inclusive process and underpinned by the human rights and equity-based health data governance principles. A global set of health data governance principles were launched in April 2022 with the core objectives of protecting people, promoting health value and prioritizing equity. They were developed through an inclusive and consultative process, bringing together expertise from over 200 contributors across geographies and sectors, and have already been endorsed by over 140 organizations and governments. Once developed, we ultimately want to see a global framework adopted and adapted by countries into national legislation to enable a world with more trust in health systems, stronger safeguards and better health outcomes for you, me and her. Transform Health is calling for action from the WHO and its member states to prioritize health data governance and a global framework. Over 140 organizations have signed a letter demanding that action be taken on this important agenda. Scan the QR code and join them today. Find more information at healthdataprinciples.org and transformhealthcoalition.org. Thank you. Um, so just to set a bit of framing for today's discussion, um, now we'll move over to the panel discussion for our session today. We have a fantastic panel of experts to provide a lot of valuable insights around what some of the challenges and issues are around health data governance, as well as some of the opportunities of how we can really advance this agenda to strengthen those health data governance systems for better health outcomes. So I would like to start by introducing our first panelist, Honorable Nasser Ahmed Mazuri, who is the Minister of Health from Zanzibar. Um, so Honorable Mazuri, could you tell us about the health system reforms that Zanzibar is currently undertaking and the role that digital technology can play in supporting you to achieve your UHC goals? And how are you currently using and planning to use data to help you achieve these ambitions? And have, are there any issues that have emerged around the governance of health data in that process? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very delighted to get this opportunity of uh, participating in this plenary session. Uh, my name is Nasser Mazrui, as I've mentioned here, and I'm the Minister of uh, Health from Zanzibar. Zanzibar is an island, uh, two islands of uh, Tanzania, whereby our population is about 1.9 people. Uh, Ministry of Health in Zanzibar has taken many initiatives on reciprocating uh, uh, with the SG by by building infrastructures, proper infrastructures, and uh, equipping the hospitals, as well as uh, uh, supply of uh, 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 consumables, as well as medicine. But as far as uh, the role of the digital technology, which has been applied, as you know that uh, 
as many other countries, uh, a lot of uh, fragmented programs were there, whereby data were collected from different programs. Malaria, they're collecting their own programs. Uh, maternity, their own programs. HIV AIDS, their own programs. So all these were duplicating a fragmented systems. But as 2020, we have uh, analyzed all these programs, and now we have a strategy of 20 up to 25, whereby all these programs are integrated. Uh, this program is integrated, and we are working together to, to keep uh, uh, digital technology in proper way. Why we want to achieve universal health coverage for the whole Zanzibar, and this is uh, our target, and how we are promoting digital health strategy by giving tools and capacity building of our, of our people, of our workers, to work on a different uh, levels. As you know that uh, we have uh, community-based workers, we have uh, dispensaries, we have uh, health centers, district hospitals, regional hospitals, as well as referral hospitals. So all these levels, we have to collect data. But the most important data, because our main job is uh, prevention, from the community, if we can do better prevention, then we'll reduce uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, disease on, on, on top there. So prevention is better than cure. Uh, so prevention and health education, all is done from the community level. We are very thankful to the D3 because they help us on uh, motivation of CHVs whereby we they were, they were given with the mobile Android mobile phones, collecting all the data from the from from house to house, door to door. And uh, we have now the data of all the people of Zanzibar. Not only that, but Pharma Access has managed through CHVs and other other sectors to enroll almost 92% of the people of Zanzibar. Now we have registration cards, whereby before that, only last year, everybody was using a book whenever he goes to the hospital. But from July this year, we'll have cards, whereby a patient will go to the hospital with, 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 with his card. And in the card, all the data are protected in the card and are not lost. And the doctor can uh, get, can raise all the data from the card and can start treating the patient by knowing the history of the patient from, from, from the beginning to the end. This health coverage, uh, this, health, this uh, technology is helping us a lot in uh, giving the right diagnosis to, to our patient. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only that, but also uh, is helping us uh, to help our people. Because now we know the problem, for example, we have a problem of maternal mortality in Zanzibar. We want to know why we have this problem. And uh, by all the data showed that we need to, to give our applicable women in the rural areas their anemia, their anemic. We have to give them uh, iron as well as folic acid. Mm -hmm. And in, rural, in, in, in urban area, we have to get women with uh, hypertension. So we should check them earlier and treat them earlier so that we save their lives. So this technology is helping us to save lives of children and pregnant women. And then uh, also it has helped us. For the last 60 years in Zanzibar, we have free medication, free medical services which is very difficult, and the government is overwhelmed with the load of uh, free medication. Now, in transit from free medical treatment to universal health care or insurance, now uh, these data have helped us a lot to enact a new law for uh, this uh, insurance, uh, universal health care, whereby all the people will be having insurance, will be covered, and this will help in the government to give better service to the people, but also human resource. Now, because of data, a little bit of data, 
we can control human resources, and also we know now, we know now what is the gap and how to be filled accordingly. Not only that, but we have uh, ZMR, electronic uh, health records, whereby anybody who goes to the hospital now, we analyze and we know exactly which disease is affecting which area and why, according to the demography of those areas. But also, we have now data dashboard, which myself, I'm in the office, I can know exactly what is going on all over the islands or to this island. And also have through pharma access on quality control of all our health, of health centers, whereby they've been given the iPad and myself I have my own iPad as well. And it is very easy to analyze what is the real problem from the, from the, from the source and how we can act immediately on the source. But also, this data base is helping us on, uh, on uh, medical supplies, chain supply from the, from the menstrual to procurement, menstrual mm. to the health centers. So this data um, is helping us a lot in management of, uh, of our hospitals, of health centers, as well the ministry can now uh, oversee all what is going on from the community level to dispensaries, health centers, district hospitals, regional hospital up to referral. And this is a good achievement and we are very thankful to the technology because otherwise we will be still taking physical uh, data and storing a lot of papers and taking a lot of time to reach one place to another. There's a political will in the government of Zanzibar that uh, once we are getting all these data, we have to protect the data, disconnect the data, share the data, but protect the privacy of the patient as well as uh, the security of the data. We are working as uh, we call onion. Onion, you know, onion has got, has got segments. Mm -hmm. So everybody is getting data according to the segments of the onion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Missouri, uh, for really highlighting, you know, I think you said a key point, and I want to emphasize that, political will. A lot of this, it's not about the technical solutions, it's about the political will to make sure the right things are in place. So just sharing some of the lessons from Zanzibar around the new digital health, the new health strategy, and the role that digital health and digital tools are really playing to help support that. And you mentioned a lot of key points around, you know, improving data collection, understanding what the health issues are, treatment, response, decision-making quality, a lot of really key elements of where digital health, but also then importantly, better decision-making from data can really help that. Um, I'd now like to introduce our second panelist, Steve McPhilly, the Director of Data and Analytics from WHO. From your perspective, Steve, what are, why do we need to improve and have stronger, more equitable governance of health data? And what are some of the risks if this isn't addressed? And if you can maybe share some of the key challenges, needs, lessons emerging from countries where you're working. Okay, thanks, Kirsten. Good afternoon, everybody. My pleasure to be here. So let, let me take a step back. Um, th there's a famous book by Dan DeLillo called White Noise. And in that book, he, is, he, is, he says that we are the sum of our data. And if that's true, and I think it probably is today in the digital era, then data are much more than a commodity. They actually are our identity. So we really need to take the issue of data governance seriously. So it, it, and the reason that's important, if we think about the aspirations that we just heard from the minister, and if we think about that more globally, if we want to facilitate research, if we want to develop digital products that are actually consuming data to help health outcomes, we need to facilitate the movement and the management and the use of those data in a way that doesn't actually corrupt or destroy our identity. Now, th this can be a very serious issue in some countries. So for example, if you have HIV in some countries, this can effectively be a death sentence, not, not because of HIV necessarily, but because of the reaction of the state to that disease. So your health status is particularly, I, th I think it's particularly sensitive of all the data that pertain to us, whether it's financial 
um, anything else. I think health data is particularly, particularly sensitive. So finding a way to govern that data that facilitates innovation, that facilitates use, and yet balances that, so our rights against, um, or sorry, balances the use and, and, and of those data against our rights as individuals. That's a tricky proposition and it requires governance. At the UN level, in parallel to what we're doing at the WHO, there's a lot of work um, going on. Um, in fact, you may have seen a, a report just in the last few days on international multilateralism, which makes a strong call for global data governance. The chief executives board of the UN are meeting this week and we, we, we're optimistic that they will endorse uh, a position paper from the UN on the need for global data governance, which is broader than health. But then the health data governance needs to sit within that broader umbrella, um, as I said, because it's probably the most sensitive constituency of all the data that exists. So that's why it's so important. Um, and I think really, if we don't get this right, that there'll be terrible accidents and, and that will set back the entire data use agenda. So we, we need to manage this carefully. We need to give countries the, the policy space to think about this. Um, what we've seen in, in recent years with GDPR is the European Union is forcing a particular model of, of data privacy and data privacy is only one element of govern, governance. But there are different models, there are different philosophies around the world and we need to find a, a way to discuss this that we can find a global commonality um, that allows us to, to, to move and use data. So the challenges are many. As I said, there's different philosophies, different ideologies. I think one of the bigger challenges is, is almost inertia, which might sound a funny thing to say because we're all talking about AI at the moment, we're all talking about data governance, and yet we, we see a lot of administrations don't actually fully understand this issue, and, and they're not taking it seriously because they, they haven't really grasped the importance of it, not just for health, but for their economy, for their human rights, for gender rights, for social protection. Data governance really is going to have colossal implications. Um, so I, I think inertia is probably one of the, the single biggest challenges, is helping governments to engage with this issue in a way that they understand. I'm a statistician, and, and the challenge for me is when I talk to governments they tend to think, okay, this is a statistician, so of course he's going to talk about data. But it's helping them to understand that if they want an, a more efficient administration, if they want to reduce things like fraud, if they want to improve competitiveness, these aren't statistical issues, these are policy issues, and they need to discuss them. And data is going to be at the heart of those issues. But let me stop there for the moment. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, I want to particularly emphasize points you made around the particular sensitivities around health data and therefore the governance that's needed for that, but recognizing really that health data has such an important in terms of the governance for its use, but then also making sure the right protections, because that is, there are so many risks around if the right protections aren't in place. And making sure that decision makers and governments are really understanding how important this issue is and taking the right actions and going back to maybe the first point that the minister said of political will so it's around the importance of having the right political will to take action of what's needed to improve the governance of that health data um, now i'd like to introduce our third panelist yong yi min who's the chief of the sustainable development goal monitoring section of un desa and from a UN perspective, what are some of the challenges as well as opportunities you see for more equitable and inclusive health data use? Thank you, Kirsten, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this exciting uh, session. And I totally agree with what uh, Steve and the minister just said, and I just want to re-emphasize and maybe um, mention a couple uh, additional things. The first is uh, investment in data, and in many countries, there's just lack of data. There's particular for low and middle income countries, there's no data, no, not sufficient health data, not mention disaggregate data to uh, 
monitors and marginalize the group. So there's no systematic uh, health uh, data system uh, is lacking of that. And for even for country with uh, some uh, sufficient data, um, there's not a sufficient disaggregate data um, that uh, by um, genders, uh, uh, um, age, social economic status. This is uh, make it very uh, difficult to identify and address the health inequalities and ensure that no one is, be, is left behind. And, and I just want to re-emphasize, uh, I think that, uh, Steve and the uh, minister mentioned, the data privacy and the security. This is a really, really important because the health data is highly sensitive. As Steve mentioned, uh, if misuse, uh, this data can, can cause discrimination and stigmatization. Um, and this has to be treated really um, careful. So there's a need uh, uh, guidelines, the protocols on how we uh, collect the data, store the data, access the data, um, and share the data. Um, and, um, another challenge I see is uh, the fragmentation of the health data. Um, in many countries, uh, um, the, the health information is fragmented. There is a public uh, uh, health provider, a different system, and there's uh, um, private uh, um, data, uh, health uh, providers. And so make it a very difficult um, not to exchange data and combine this information from the different uh, sources. So, so this also hinders effort uh, to analyze the data and make a good policy. So this is a, a, like a, some of the main challenges. So in addition, um, I will also say the, the transparency and accountability issues, uh, we don't like uh, in many cases, uh, people don't know how their data has been stored and how has, is it been used uh, um, for, for policy making. And for the, opt uh, the UN uh, organization, what are the opportunities? I think uh, Steve mentioned, so currently there is a, um, a discussion um, going on on this uh, global data governance. So the house the data governance is falling is part of this. Um, it's neither falling under the umbrella because there are different countries has a different uh, um, data governance practice, uh, different sector has their own governance. So there's need a standard um, um, international uh, governance uh, standard. Every uh, sector country can use that as the guidelines. And there's uh, the, the um, uh, digital health technology also present opportunity for more equitable and inclusive health data use. Um, the use this te technology also lead to the improve the health outcome by enabling um, more personalized treatment and intervention and uh, improve uh, disease surveillance, and facilitating um, early disease uh, detection. We also hear that uh, can um, improve the efficiency of the system by reducing a lot of the administrative burden and improve care uh, um, uh, coordination and also increase uh, the, the patient engagement. Um, so just summarize, um, we, as the UN, we want to call for increased investment in data, and all, including in health data system and also um, try to uh, mobilize uh, uh, the, the technology, digital technology, improve the quality and the accessibility of health data, and uh, a particular than when resources is limited. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just a few points to highlight there that really important about the need for investment in data, ensuring good quality, sufficient and disaggregated data. And actually one of the principles of the health data governance principles is around prioritizing equity. So not only making sure that people are represented in the data, but that there's equitable benefit from the use of that data as well. So really, really important point there. And then, you know, the importance of issues around, again, which has been said, data privacy and security and transparency. That's a really key point you've mentioned about how data is collected, how it's used, how it's stored, because without trust in health data systems, people also won't, won't want their data to be shared, and then we're limiting the data that can be used to help improve those health decisions and outcomes. Um, so thank you for that. And our fourth 
panelist. Um, I'd like to introduce Steve Aulis. He's the project director of CHISU, which is a country health information systems and data use program at JSI. So JSI is implementing with its partners a series of projects in different regions related to health information systems and how to improve health data management, including through the CHISU program. So through your work, what are some of the common challenges you've observed on the governance of health data? And what have been your experiences regarding the prioritization of health data governance in national digital health strategies? Sure, great. Well, thank you uh, very much. And it's nice to be a part of this panel, particularly that I get to come at the end as so many uh, great, great remarks have been made and I will be repeating some of them, but uh, you can see the common themes. So as CHISU, um, we work to strengthen the overall governance of the health information system and in working in more than 20 countries. So we're countries that we support are in Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean region. And we've, you know, seen many countries and funding partners have seen the promise of going digital. And so there's been this investment in digitization, but that's great, <laughs> but it results in this proliferation of systems and these difficult parts of the data use, the governance and the interoperability have been kept, kept until later. And now we're starting to pay the price, but we know that these are really critical components to achieve that digital transformation and start to see that return on investment that's been made. So there are many challenges um, in the, that we've seen in the programs that we support. We tend to be kind of on the technology side and also then on the political side. Um, on the technology side, you know, we, we, as you saw in this video, you know, five billion people have connectivity, which is great. And then as we heard this morning, three billion people do not. And so particularly as we're working to achieve universal health coverage, we're really seeing you know, how can we ensure that we're getting the data and being able to incorporate the health needs of people at that com community level and the primary care level. So a lot of the work that we do actually uh, is around addressing the lack of ICT infrastructure. So the devices, the network connectivity, um, servers, and making sure that this is available. Um, we know the COVID-19 pandemic really highlighted a lot of gaps in health systems and particularly also in the health information systems and the ability to be able to access timely data. So we know that these, that these systems and these tools are needed. Um, in addition to having then the, the infrastructure, then for the software themselves, you know, there are many global goods that are out there and there are many software systems that can address needs, but we find that on the health workforce side, there are some gaps. So in many countries we're supporting, including East and Southern Caribbean, um, in addition to uh, having the you know, systems put in, governments are requesting support for actually use, and maintaining and implementing these systems. So we've embedded trained consultants to help better define those needs and translate those needs to the vendors who are providing those services. And we've been providing that support in a variety of countries, including Indonesia, Haiti and Burkina Faso. I think going back to the infrastructure idea, in a number of countries, including Ghana, we've conducted ICT infrastructure assessments to be able to see where those gaps are. Um, but we also need to move beyond to just having that data done on an annual basis and waiting for those funding to become available to actually getting that in an automated fashion so that can be received and we can see in real time or near real time where are those devices, again, being able to see if those investments that we made are being used. And even in all aspects of this, um, and I'll touch on this later, but we need to look at the, the gender aspects and gender considerations in, the, in everything, but even in this ICT infrastructure. So as we are collecting this data, who's collecting the data? And as we are finding whether, where these devices are and who has connectivity, who is it that has access to these devices? Um, despite the fact that you know, the health workforce is largely female in most places, you still find that devices are largely still controlled uh, by men or majority men in, in many places. And then back to this interoperability point. Um, this lack of interoperability also helps us or keeps us from being able to realize the benefits of all the information that's collected. And so we, it's not so easy to put together. And so in places like Mali, we've been performing um, interoperability maturity assessments that led to the development of interoperability standards and guidance to enable more effective governance of the data. And then back to the, the political piece and the policies and standards, we see gaps at a few levels. In some cases, the policies and guidance are not, do not exist, and in other places, they do exist, but they are lovely documents that sit up on a shelf. And where is the, and it's important to have 
data governance and governance of the health information system at a high level, but really at the point of data generation. This is at the subnational, the facility, the community health worker level, and we need to make sure that those policies and procedures are being translated down to those, uh, to those levels. So we've worked on this in a few places. Malawi, for example, we supported the development of national standards for quality data and the formation of the National Malaria Strategy and ensuring that data use was built in there and then helping to roll those standards and policies out to the subnational and facility level. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, really important comments there and observations and experiences from your programs at JSI of, you know, that there is that investment, there is clear recognition of the opportunities of digital and investment in that, but you also need the right investment to make sure that digital transformation is effective and the investments in interoperability, infrastructure, human resources, and making sure that understanding of who's using that digital technology to make sure it's effective. So whether it's gender dimensions or going back to the point that Youngie made about the disaggregation in general of who, who's, who's using it, who's being impacted by it. Um, and then a really good point, and I think you heard in a lot of discussions that either in some cases the policies aren't there, in a lot of cases they are there, but they're not being implemented. So it's not enough to develop it, but it's about really them putting it into action. Um, so we've heard a lot about kind of what the challenges are and some of these issues around digital and the governance of health data. I now want to do a quick round um, again with all of our policy, with all of our panelists, looking a little bit more at kind of what is some of the work and opportunities to really advance this agenda so we are strengthening the governance of health data. So if I can come back to you, Honorable Missouri. Um, so the Ministry of Zanzibar has recently developed a health data governance framework, which is really, again, shows the leadership in terms of having a national framework to govern the health data and the political will around that. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that and any key lessons, next steps? Thank you very much, Weza. As the Minister of, 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 of Health, I want to make sure that uh, data is leveraged to promote and achieve UHC in a way that coordinated and aligned across departments, programs, uh, implementing and research partners. As a strong framework for health data govern governance is essential to achieve this goal. This is our goal and we need to strengthen our, our, our health insurance. If our data is going to be better, then this project is going to be very, very well performed. Our strategy will be implemented fully so that we have safer, equitable, accessible, efficient, and effective health services at all levels through proper use of affordable digital technologies. We have challenges, we have gaps, we need to, to see them because we have a roadmap, roadmap which, which has been, uh, we, have, we, have, we have strategy which has been uh, uh, made by the help of Danida, we have uh, also roadmap which has been also our partner Ditri, mm -hmm. and uh, this health insurance, our partner was from Access. All these partners have been with us. Uh, we have to make sure that we have better service for the people of Zanzibar by overcoming all the challenges and all the gaps. We have the gaps with the challenges, but our, our aim is to invest on this roadmap so that Zanzibar now realize that uh, is new Zanzibar, which is going to use digital health as a major role of working through health sector. Uh, by the help of partners and uh, everybody in Zanzibar, this is what we have to do. Capacity building is very important because our all uh, workers, they need to know and to understand how governance of data, how data can be secured, how data can be shared, and that, how data can be used for the betterness of the people of Zanzibar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, maybe just those final points there, which are really important. First, the leadership of the government of developing a health data governance framework, but also really just that ensuring that the impetus behind it around, you know, protecting people's data, making sure it's used for the public good, the right protections around there. And so just really the leadership in that, which is really brilliant to see. Um, so Steve, from WHO, so how is WHO addressing the issue of health data governance, including working with countries to support them around this issue? And how could a global health data governance framework support with this? Yeah, so the WHO, obviously it's part of the UN, so a lot of what we do, or a very important part, 
is we have the convening power, firstly to raise issues and then to discuss issues. And that may sound trite, but it's actually a really important um, contribution because a, a lot of times individual member states may find it difficult to discuss these issues or they don't know what to do. So by bringing experts um, and discussing these issues, that's really important. We develop a lot of normative standards um, around governance, around principles, and again, countries are free to adapt those, they can amend them, but at least it gives them a starting point. Um, we work with the UN, obviously I work with Yangi quite a lot, so a lot of what we do on the data side is to make sure that what we're doing is consistent with what the data community at the, the UN Statistical Commission are doing. So any policies that we formulate, especially at the normative level, are consistent uh, with what's going on um, in other parts of the UN system. And if you take something like health information systems, so Steve mentioned them, I mean, in a lot of countries they're fragmented, they're digitizing. So a lot of the work that we're doing now is helping member states to integrate digital and data together because in a lot of cases they're seen as two disparate things and in fact they're not, they're, they're bedfellows. And helping them to think as well about the transition from health information systems to what I would call information systems for health which is trying to de-silo health, health data and integrate it into the wider administrative system. So what am I talking about here? It's, it's looking at the determinants of health. So if we really want to understand what's happening, we want to be able to link health data with education data, with tax data, to understand outcomes and determinants. To do that though, you need to put in place good national data infrastructure, you need to put in place unique identifiers, and then this is where the governance becomes critical because now to do what we're talking about here, we're talking about the movement of data from one department to another, from one institution to another. So it's absolutely critical that the governance mechanisms are in place that facilitate those data. And it's back to my earlier intervention so that we don't compromise individuals' identity um, and we don't expose them to risk. So. This is crucially what we're doing. And then one last point is we work very carefully with the ministries of health, but we're also increasingly working very carefully or very closely with the national statistical offices, because again, it's crucial that the data experts in the country, which oftentimes come from the national statistical office, that they're involved and they help to formulate the data policies in each individual country. So we can give advice but it's up to each country to formulate their own policy. But it's very important that the Ministry of Health doesn't do it in isolation. So it's really important that the national statistical offices are involved. Thanks, Steve, for sharing some of the work that WHO is doing as well within the wider UN system. I think it's really important that that point about integrating, we can't have separate conversations talking about digital and then talking about data. They're very much part of the same conversation. And I think this is said time and time again, and we need to make sure it's really happening. Um, so it's not these two isolated and fragmented discussions. And then also just the recognition of its health data is critical, but it's other data that very much has an impact on health that's also important as well. So it's not just health, but health related data as well and the importance of the integration across that. Um, and really important, the role of WHO in supporting countries, providing that normative guidance that can give some of those kind of standards um, around what good data governance should look like. Um, so now, Yongi, from a, the perspective of the, of the wider UN system, what are you doing to address data governance? And how can a system-wide approach support better governance of health data, but also recognizing the role in particular sensitivities around health data that need some of its own specific governance systems and regulations? Thank you. Um, I think Steve already mentioned this work by the High Level Committee on Pro Program of UN System Chief uh, uh, Executive Board. So they're currently talking about this international uh, data governance. So we also have the, uh, Steve also mentioned the Statistical Commission. This is the highest uh, um, international statistical uh, body that uh, um, the govern, um, make up uh, for the international uh, standards uh, and the responsible also develop a concept method, including their implementation at the and country and national level, not only for health data, but also for other data areas. 
And under this uh, statistical system, and we also expand our mandate we used to cover only statistical. Now the um, in 2022, and the revised TR also cover data issues. So um, currently on the statistical commission, um, we have a working group on data stewardship. And one of the uh, very important work stream of this uh, um, data stewardship working group is on data governance. So um, the current working provide guidance uh, to the national statistical office uh, regarding data governance and the legal framework um, to assist them in transforming and, and potentially expanding their role of uh, uh, the data stores. And, and uh, the UN and system uh, can, should develop a common principle for uh, data governance to apply for all countries, uh, all sectors, including on health. So this principle should grant in the human rights and also the right for privacy and also right to access information. And as a UN, we also can play a role to force the collaboration and the coordination. So a system-wide approach can foster this uh, collaboration and coordination among other UN agencies and also um, uh, within the country that has a specific governance structure to ensure the health data governance align with the broader uh, goals and the principles and guidelines. And I think I will mention again, re-emphasize uh, um, the transparency and accountability. And we need to promote this uh, transparency and accountability and in the health data uh, governance and also ensure um, uh, this data collection use and sharing and conducting an open transparent, transparent manner and, uh, and UN can help to develop in clear guidance and policy for data governance and make them um, public available. Um, and we also hear there's a lot of different uh, situations in country um, and we have to uh, respect uh, and uh, the different capacity in different countries and try to, as a UN system, we help the country to build uh, the, the national statistical capacity and health statistical capacities. So maybe I will I'll stop here. Thanks, Yangyi. Um, yeah, really great to see the moves within the wider UN data system of going from just looking at statistics to looking at data um, and the importance of data then around decision making, et cetera. And, you know, the working group of the data stewardship working group and the role that the UN, wider UN system can play in convening the different UN bodies around this issue, because while there are specific issues and particular sensitivities around health data, it's within that broader data system within a country as well. Um, and also within countries themselves, they're not looking just at one, one data set, for example, but it's looking within the wider data ecosystem. So the role that that can play in helping to facilitate the wider governance discussions. Um, Steve, back over to you. So JSI is one of the endorsers of the health data governance principles, which I mentioned earlier during the session, um, which very much lay, we see as laying the foundation for the development of a global health data governance framework. Why do you think a global framework is important and how can it support countries in strengthening their national data governance systems? Great, yeah, thank you for that, uh, for that question. And I think uh, a, a global framework like this can be, can be really important because it can, to touch on the point that, that Steve had raised earlier, um, it can help countries avoid reinventing the wheel. And this happens, we see it in so many aspects, again, whether it be a piece of software or an approach or policy, we don't want, you know, context matters. Every country is not the same, every place is not the same. But if we can help people start from not having to start from zero and being able to look at what else is out there and adapt that, I think that's very critical. So I think it's important to have this framework and standard framework so that countries can measure them, measure themselves against this or use as a guide is what they should be working towards. Again, it can avoid reinventing the wheel. And then I think particularly as we were talking about you know, health data, but also other data, we need to get into these data sharing agreements and other components that can be very painful to again have to start from scratch. And so to be able to use or at least take a look at what has worked in other contexts and think, is this something we could adapt? Is this something we could learn from, whether it be a good or bad experience, mm -hmm. can really help to accelerate this digital transformation. 
And I think the final piece is by having this global framework, it also gets back to the accountability. And so being able to have the accountability of the different actors in the health data landscape have this brought to light with the standardized framework, which will in turn help countries and the international community better be able to learn from the application of the framework. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, I think that's really important. So of course, context, context matters. It's not a one-size-fits-all one solution, but there is the opportunity through a global framework to get agreement around some common standards, which then can help support countries to strengthen national legislation or regulation. And so like you said, and very much the framework should build on what countries are already doing as well to help inform its development. Um, and then the final point, accountability, which I think is absolutely essential and is actually why we are calling for a global framework to strengthen that regulation and legislation within countries so that there is accountability around the governance of health data. I want to open up the floor now. If there are any questions from the audience, either in person or online, I've given a quick look online and I don't see any questions there, but do we have any questions from the audience here? Hi, I'm Mark Peterson. First of all, thank you to the panelists for this, for this conversation, uh, really, really interesting. Um, Steve from WHO, you, you mentioned one of the big challenges being inertia. Um, and, you know, uh, we also talked about political will being one of the big challenges here. How different is the strategy in places where the challenge that we need the political will to overcome isn't just inertia, but active opposition from other vested interests who may not want to see data protected or may not want any guardrails on how it could be used? And I'm thinking in particular, sometimes it's governments, uh, a lot of times it's the private sector. So is the strategy different for getting over that challenge, what is the strategy for that? Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yes, that's a really interesting question. Um, so the, there's two aspects. I mean, obviously around the world, as I mentioned, there's different ideologies, um, different sensitivities. So if, if we take the middle, so if we take kind of Europe, the, the, the whole kind of data governance model is based on this individual, the human rights approach. Over towards Asia, it, it, it more swings towards a, na a national approach. It's very much government-led. And then in the US, you can either interpret it as a kind of a laissez-faire approach, or it's a more capitalistic kind of enterprise-driven. They're not necessarily consistent, so that, that that's one challenge. But at the same time, for all of us to work together, we need to exchange data. So. I think there is an acceptance uh, and a growing acceptance that while we have different perspectives and maybe we're uncomfortable with the other perspectives, we, we need to do something. And so th I think there, th there is, th the tide is starting to turn. The other kind of tension that you mentioned is maybe other incentives not to share. And, and one would be proprietary data. So for example, you have a lot of private sector who hold a lot of data. But I think even there, now you, you're seeing um, in recent times, like Brad Smith from Microsoft is calling for a, a digital Geneva Convention. So th th there are, I think for the same reasons, e even though a lot of people are holding data, they're beginning to realize for them to function, there has to be some sort of playing field or some sort of rules that allows them to understand how to maximize the, uh, the benefits. Because I think they run the risk as well. I mean, all of these private sector companies run the risk of huge reputational damage if they get it wrong. And I think there's sensitivities around data. People are becoming more alert to kind of what, what data means to them. So I, I think, may, maybe I'm being overly naive or maybe overly optimistic, but I, I, I think there is a growing acceptance that something needs to be done. Now that's the easy part. There's, what that something is going to be, that, that remains to be seen. So at the UN, as I mentioned this week, the, the Chief Executives Board will, will hopefully endorse a proposal which will be the beginning of a journey where we start consulting with member states, with private sector, with civil society on what that something is going to be. Um, and God only knows wh where we'll end up. Um, so. <laughs> 
the inertia I was referencing, though, is slightly different. So I think there it's just a lack of understanding. I don't think anybody is just inert. I think in a lot of cases they just don't understand the issue. Um, so, for example, when I mentioned the continents there, I told you about what, what Europe thinks, what, what Asia thinks. I didn't mention Africa. And, and it's not clear what the, what the global position, if I can call it, of Africa is. They haven't come down on a, on a side yet. So that's a huge chunk of the world where we don't really understand what their perspective is on, on, on governance yet. Latin America, the same. So there's large parts of the world that really haven't expressed a clear view yet or haven't articulated from a policy point of view. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question. I hope it did. Thank you. One more question up here. Maybe I have time for one or two more questions. Thank you very much, and thank you for this wonderful panel discussion. Uh, two questions, I think, but just a couple of comments. In England, our National Data Guardian um, is, has published a very recent paper, and she's exploring gradually what is public benefit. I mean, like Nicola Byrne, and I think that's a really interesting point. What is public benefit? And I think she's making some progress on that. As far as risk is concerned, we have an American head of transformation in the NHS, Tim Ferriss, who's a primary care professor from Harvard, but he's been with us for five years. And he is saying we need to take more risk sharing data in the National Health Service. As far as that's concerned, during COVID, one million people every month signed up for the NHS app so they could actually share their data with other people. So that was a, that was a decision, a risk decision the public make. And I think the public are very good at making decisions, but nobody ever asks them. It's quite difficult. I love, absolutely love, very jealous, very jealous of, of your video. Um, so one question is about the public benefit. Um, the other, the other, another thing I was, I was thinking of that Wilson and Pontefract in England, I think I've shared this paper with you, interestingly enough, got an expert panel of people looking at undergraduate education on digital health in England um, on pharmacists, midwives, nurses, and, and medical under, undergraduates. And this expert panel then had it peer reviewed externally to see was this a reasonable digital health curriculum? And they found six domains of digital health they thought all undergraduates in those professions should have. And there isn't one school in England that's teaching that. So I think that's, I think that's really, that's important. So two, two, the one question um, was about public benefit. And another simple little question for Yongi was when you talk about investment, once more, is that financial investment or is that commitment investment because there isn't a lot of money around for investment for IT. I wasn't sure which type of investment you meant. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. I, it's a lot of investment, like a human resource investment, the financial report. This is very important. Um, I think at, at this time, I don't know, it's New York. We're going, we are actually uh, just uh, release a secretary report, a special edition of secretary general report on the progress towards SDG. In that report, there's a call, like a clearly call, more investment in data. One area is ask a country to increase their data and investment by 50% in general, not only health, but in general, and to try to ensure um, the 90% by uh, uh, the SDG target can be monitored by 2027. And also we, we noticed during the pandemic uh, the shift uh, of the priority and the uh, developer support for data and statistics uh, actually went down by 20%. And uh, the target is uh, uh, currently it's only 0.3% of the total ODA. And the secretary also called uh, for increase that ODA investment for global collaboration to 0.7%. So there is a clearly call for more investment. Of course, there's more uh, other like uh, technical investment uh, and collaborations and use new uh, uh, innovation, new partnerships. A lot of things have to be done. Thank you. And as did you want to add something to that? Yeah, just before we. Well, no, I, I wanted to come back to the public. Yeah, yeah, the... please do. That's a great question, um, and it's a great expression because Kirsten will tell you when we were preparing the draft for the, the Chief Executive's Board policy statement, 
we ended up in an intractable debate <laughs> about public good and data as a public good as opposed to data for the public good. And we went round in circles um, and, and we never really resolved it. <laughs> and other than I think the main conclusion was the main definition of an economic or of a public good really comes from economics. And that definition isn't sufficient for when we're talking about data. Now, we, we never really came up with a proper definition ourselves, but I think it's there as work to be done. And we explored all the terms like common good, public benefit, but I think there's a whole bunch of work to be done to actually try and articulate that. Like the question you've asked is an absolute landmine, but it's one I think we need to kind of resolve because it's so, so critical. I'm sorry, I'm just going to stop because I see this man holding up a, a one minute thing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So th thank you, everyone. So we only have, yes, one minute left. So we'll wrap up just a few concluding remarks. I first of all just want to say thank you to our brilliant panelists for sharing your, ex your insights and expertise really on this issue. And to thank our audience for joining us in person and those that were joining us online as well. So as I mentioned in my opening remarks and in the video, we're calling for a global health data governance framework to be developed and endorsed by governance to really establish that political will and that high level political commitment and agreement towards a set of common regulatory standards for the collection and use of data to really maximize that public benefit while ensuring we're safeguarding protecting individual rights. So the, the support for this agenda really is growing both from governments and from the wider community. Um, we have, there's a global call to action letter, and so I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's down at the bottom, but also feel free to reach out to me afterwards if you can't see it, um, which has been signed on by over 150 organizations, updated from the video now, um, which is calling for action on this agenda and calling for the development of a global health data governance framework. So we must really, there's a lot of opportunities this year to make sure that we are making action on this agenda at the upcoming World Health Assembly in May, as part of the UN high-level meeting in September and as part of the G20, which is prioritizing digital health within the Indian presidency of the G20. But we really need to make sure that we seize those opportunities to take the action to initiate the development of a global framework. So we move from just the rhetoric of that this is important to the action of we're actually doing something about it. And that those are key opportunities this year that we can really take to drive forward and move towards uh, what a lot of people are calling for. So we really encourage governments and the wider community to really champion this agenda and the need for stronger health data governance. And we look forward to working with many of you, hopefully, um, to take this forward. So just thank you. That concludes our session and enjoy the rest of the forum.